Wake your ass up, man. Wake your butt up, Los Angeles. It's time for the Jeff and Janky Show, Janky. Jeff and Janky to the rescue, coming to you for your morning needs. That's right. June 20th, on this important day, Jaws came out. Really? Oh, yes. That took a bite out of everything. Yeah, it sure did. To a lesser extent, this is also the day Ang Lee's Hulk came out. Ang Lee's Hulk. That's what was with Eric Bana, right? All right. Born. That that was the bad the bad uh, the, the bad uh, computer generated. Uh, Correct. You tried to do it without Lou Fringo, man. Yeah, he could do it without Lou. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kit Jones, Jimmy Shaw, we need your help. Get my screen going here, man. Oh. Dutchie, are we on the air? Are we on the air? Can you hear us? Text us, call us, let us know. Damn. Come on, people. If you hear me. Tommy, can you hear me? Yeah, if you got your Jeff Sorgent Show app on your phone, it should be going on right now. Or the now Jeff and Janky app. Yeah, but we, <laughs> we, we need Benny to help us with that. That's that's in Benny's hands right now. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Yep, 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 yep. So. So what's up, my friend? You're on the radio, man. Quit looking at your phone. Start talking. <laughs> Okay, I'm yakking. I'm yakky doodle, man. Let's 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 start no, no with our adventure over the weekend. Yeah, we <laughs> got to go rock and roll uh, weekend. Now, what hey. was that event we were at where we saw? I saw Tom Kenny, we Voice to Honors, with his big band, Toyzilla Summerfest. No, no, Tom Kenny played the street, right? He didn't play in the private bar. No, no, there was two things going on, but it was all one event. You know, we were we went to Toyzilla Summerfest in Alhambra, and. Uh, it was kind of magical. Jeff says to me, come on, man, let's go upstairs. And this is a toy store, and, uh, and, they, uh, and they have bands and everything. And they had this cool private bar. We went up to the private bar. Yes. And we were looking for our pal Carlos Velarde over at NerdBot, but we went into the wrong bar. So it's Jeff and I and like eight other people. And who should walk in but Redbone? Bum, 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 Raven bum. Blackwing, the guitar singer, founder of uh, Redbone. And so Jeff and I are drinking booze. We, we kicked in to help the bartender pick up supplies so he'd give us free booze the rest of the night. And we got to see the Guardians of the Galaxy's greatest hit. Yeah, come I mean. And get your love live. Come and get your love live. We actually sang along to it, which is kind of rock and roll. Yeah. Five feet away, toasting them with our drinks. It was a magical weekend. Yeah. And not only that, and then earlier in the day, because you didn't get there till later, but that's when uh, when all the other comic and toy vendors were out there on the corner of uh, Main Street, and I saw Wonder are, Woman. I saw Wonder Woman when I was pulling up, and I just thought it's more fun to be in the bar. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, I already saw the action earlier because I saw Tom Kenny and his big giant band. I like Tom Kenny. I knew him a little bit from uh, when he did uh, uh, Tim and Eric. You know, yeah. he was very nice. He was on the Crimbus special with us. Oh, he was on Crimbus. Yeah. Oh, was... I mean, he was very nice, and we hung out with him. You know what I mean? I mean, you'd be talking to him, and you'd forget he was SpongeBob. Yeah, or the Ice King from Adventure Time. Or the Ice King from Adventure Time. I'm... Or Rocco from Rocco's Modern Life. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. All right. And uh, his big band, he even performed some of the SpongeBob songs. Yeah, that's kind of rock and roll. You know what I mean? Yeah. I'm just trying to see if anyone responded to uh, to us us being on the air <laughs> or not on the air, as the case may be. Come and get your love. I like Spine. I like uh, Red Bone. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, that was a. It was a fun weekend. There were some good cosplayers. Uh, I got a deal in the two dollar action figure box. Congratulations. I got me a cool uh, Alicia uh, Silverstone Stone. Batgirl. <laughs> She's in a really trippy movie. Have you seen The Killing of a Sacred Deer? No. Yeah, I didn't even recognize her. Is that a new one? Yeah, it's yeah. really disturbing. Wow. It's disturbing. This um, Colin Farrell plays this cardiologist 
who was an alcoholic and when he was an alcoholic accidentally screwed up and this guy died on the table. Oh my God. So his teenage son shows up and uh, the, the son of the guy he let die. And he dines with the teenage son every week and, and you're not sure what the relationship is. And then one day the teenage son lets them know if they, uh, if he, he has to kill one of his own family members. Oh God. Okay, we're on the air. I just got it from uh, the 541. Thank you. All right. We just got confirmation that you can hear us. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, yeah, about yeah. that movie. So it's a really trippy little movie. You know what I mean? I mean, uh, it disturbed me. Uh, um. Well, that's kind of hard when you disturb uh, when you disturb Janky from, from with a movie. It did. By the way, thank you. That was the lovely Michelle Hanula confirming that we're on the air. Thank oh. you, Michelle. Thank you, Michelle. Okay, cool, cool, cool. So we got a good guest coming in today. If, if the phone lines are open, we'll have. Otherwise, I have to call him on my phone. But it'll be one of the founders of the Groundlings. Yes, Mr. Sandy Hilberg. He was known for, uh, if you've seen all the Mel Brooks movies. Yeah, he's in Spaceballs. Spaceballs. Um, um, Mortal Kombat, Spinal Tap, History of the World. Uh, thanks, baby. High yeah, Anxiety. Michelle, Michelle, like your shout out. <laughs> High Anxiety. High Anxiety, yeah. Another good one. Oh, yeah. No, the guy's got a ton of work. So it'll be fun to talk to him. Even on a... Episodes of MASH. Yeah, let's, let's, let's look at old Sandy's resume. New Hold Heart on. Show. Uh, New Heart, the original, whoa, whoa, whoa. Original New Heart or 80s? Trapper John, Knight Rider even. Wow, no Hulk? No Hulk. <laughs> Sandy Heiberg. Uh, Hollywood Nights, Flatbush. Ho uh, Hollywood Nights was Michael Jackson's favorite movie. Did you know that? No. Yeah, I told that to uh, Gary, who appeared in the movie. He didn't know that either. Oh, that's right, huh? Oh, crap. He's in the Up the Creek with another one of our guests with the great... Uh, How about... Do you remember Tara in the Wax Museum? I do, 1973, actually. man. They actually cut off the head of a uh, beautiful woman named Victoria Carroll before she married her husband, Michael Bell. Yeah. Victoria Carroll's the head on the table. But that's the one with Cameron Mitchell. I believe it is. Yeah. Yes, sir. So he's going to be uh, calling at 7.15. It's 7.09. So a magical weekend, though. I, I had a good time. You went to the Ren Fair on Sunday. and he got, you know, just uh, Yeah, good. that was fun. Knights in shining armor. Knights in dull armor. We had. I saw a couple barbarians I took photos with. Um, uh, I ran into a few people I knew. And, uh, and some people recognized me as Zoltar the Pirate. Oh. And... Um, the the wash tub uh, the wash tub wenches put on a great show, they a comedy show. They were hilarious, man. Did you so want, it's did one you more weekend. Next weekend is the last week, and did I will be there as uh, one of the three musketeers. Really, which one? Uh, assos, assos, <laughs> posos, <laughs> tios. <laughs> Colossos. <laughs> You'll be the homeless musketeer. <laughs> Actually, uses, there's four. He you uses see. his cape as a blanket. <laughs> and, and they're still called the Three Musketeers plus D'Artagnan, right? Right, because D'Artagnan's the young guy trying to join. Very yeah. good. Yes, sir. I did what? Guy four, four more minutes, and we got a guest. <laughs> it doesn't sound like you're stalling or nothing. <laughs> doesn't sound like you're stalling. Do, 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 do. Married with children. Wow. <laughs> oh, she tagged us in a post. How oh, sex. Thank, Thank you, you Michelle. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Yay. Yay. Awesome. I know. I'm, and now that Michelle's listening, we've got to make this show worthy of her. Yeah. <laughs> So Sandy's got a ton of credits. We'll discuss in a minute. Did you see The Incredibles 2 yet, Jeffrey? 
No, I'm I'm dying to see that. I'm looking at all the cool toys that they're putting out. A bunch of friends who saw the new Jurassic Park are complaining it's boring. Really? Yeah. It's out already? And I guess it opens on Friday, but they went to the test screen. Oh, to the sneak peek? Yeah. Uh, and I've got, like, uh, another friend posted he was, like, 15 minutes in the movie and trying to stay awake because nothing was happening. Oh, my God. How I do you mean, make a boring dinosaur movie? You, how, how in the hell do you get a boring dinosaur movie in this day and age? I mean, every time I see that clip of the Velociraptor running down the hall, I'm thinking, take my money, please. <laughs> Yeah, damn. I love Velociraptors. <laughs> I took a picture with one um, at the E3 convention, the E3 gaming convention last week. You kept buying it drinks, but it kept ignoring you? No, I was there, <laughs> man. I get in there. Uh, I saw the Ant-Man and the Wasp costume. Really? In the display cases. Yeah. Nifty. Oh, so you did do E3 this weekend. No, it wasn't over the weekend. It was last uh, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Did our friend come out? You know who I'm talking about? Who? Noel? Dressed as a zombie? MS. Who? Uh, who? Come on, <laughs> tell me. Uh, oh, hell no. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, in joke, people. Um, Inside joke. Boy, boy, so Ant-Man was there with Stan Lee there. Uh, no, no, just the costume. Stan Lee doesn't go to E3 gaming conventions, no. And uh, what else, True Believer? Um, Stan Lee's Kamikaze is coming back in October, but it is now called LA Comic Con. No connection to Stan anymore. Oh, wow. Yep. It's not used to be Stan Lee's. Comic right, and everyone would be excited because, oh, my God, it's a comic convention Stanley approves of. I think they just wrote him a check. <laughs> That's what I think. Okay, I'm going to have to call. I'm going to have to call him because, because uh, I'm not seeing nothing on my board right here on the screen. Really? And that's uh, our faculty here. That's their problem that should be ready for us. Cool. Okay, um, I'm going to call him right now. That sounds good. I'm going to call him. I'm going to call Sandy. <laughs> Can you hear us, Sandy? Logs. Do, do, do. Hey, while you're typing, I'm going to make some coffee. <laughs> okay, well, I'm going to call him right now. Call, call, call him real slow. I'm gonna mosey on over here. Well, hey, Pat. Yeah. You need to get your ass back in here. That's returning. I'm returning, baby boy. Yeah. I need me some coffee. Okay, here we go. Is that my phone or yours? My phone. Good morning, Sandy Helberg. Morning to you. All right. Uh, Good morning, Sandy. Welcome to the Jeff and Janky Show. You are coming. Wow. Rise and shine, everybody. Wake up, people. We got one of the original groundlings here. Oh, boy. Yes, sir, Sandy. Mr. Mel Brooks man himself. Let's talk about <laughs> you. Where are you from? Well, uh, I was original. Well, originally, I was born in Germany, Frankfurt, Germany. Then, for some reason, we moved to Toledo, Ohio. Wow, not far from the mistake on the lake. No, not at all. And then from there, I ran screaming to New York, and then <laughs> I uh, wound up. <laughs> I wound up. I realized Toledo is not a place for me, but, you know, who's going to ask a one-year-old baby who doesn't <laughs> speak English, you want to go to Toledo or you want to go to New York? So How big was your Toledo. beard as a baby, Sandy? <laughs> How big was my beard? Well, I had very long sideburns, that, uh, mutton chops that I connected at the bottom oh. of my chin. Nice, but, nice, uh, <laughs> nice. You know, I was circumcised in Germany, and... Uh, but it does grow back. <laughs> I imagine it and every other part of you would feel much more comfortable not in Germany. 
no, no, no. You know, it's uh, look. You know, you got to forgive and forget, but it is <laughs> hard to for- forget. You know? Amen to that, brother. Hey, let's start. <laughs> let's start with a simple question. How'd you get your sad card? <laughs> uh, I, I was working uh, as a production assistant at Paramount for this uh, real nasty guy, and uh, uh-huh. he was shooting these he was shooting these B movies uh, with like old timers like Broderick Crawford and Raymond uh, 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 Ray Milland, and you know there was like nobody under eighty. And uh, so I begged him. There was a tiny little part, mm-hmm. and. Uh, so this guy was so intimidating. So he said, okay, I'll give you this part. It was the first time I ever did anything on film. And he took his chair and he put it like about 10 feet away from me and sat there intimidating me. But I got through it. And uh, it was a movie called Terror in the Wax Museum. Oh, you worked with oh my Kennedy. God. You worked with Ray Milland. We were just talking about that about 15 minutes ago. <laughs> wow. Oh, my God. I'm sure you were. I'm sure. You know, we cool. were. It was one of those crazy 70s TV movies where all these old husbands would wind up in like, like you know, they were in the theater they were doing stuff like uh, Dear Dead Delilah and all this. And so TV would imitate it with Ray Milland and the wax makeup, not half as good as Vincent Price. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, Ray Milland, he did that thing uh, with Rosie Greer. What was it? The, the thing, thing with, with two heads. heads. <laughs> right. Oh, yeah, the incredible two-headed transplant, one of my favorites. That's yeah. a good one. And then Broderick Crawford, uh, he was such a character. This guy was bombed every day. Yeah, I was about to ask you about he, that. Broderick Crawford, he, let me... He, he, go ahead. Yeah. No, no, go ahead. I was going to say, Broderick Crawford, for our audience, hosted Saturday Night Live in the early days, but he was a famous tough guy on, uh, on, on Highway Patrol and stuff like that. And the director, Mike Caffey, mentioned that he was so drunk when he did some hospital show with him, he would be laying there uh, drunk and he would put a medical book <laughs> open on his stomach because he was so bombed it would look like he was up at all night reading his <laughs> medical textbooks when he was really just drunk on the couch. Tell us your brother Crawford story, brother. Oh, he, uh, well, you know, also he did win an Academy Award. You're a long, long that, time that, before. That, there, <laughs> well, yeah, a long time before. But so. Uh, so did Milan, so by the way. Drunk. So did Milan for Lost Pardon Weekend. Me? Ray Milan, who was in the same uh, movie, won it for yeah, Lost he Weekend. Won, yeah, yeah, he won. Uh, he, so he, uh, uh, you know, he would show up drunk. And uh, <laughs> one day he'd show up, his, his face was all bruised, and they'd put him back in his dressing room. And. And then uh, he finally uh, came to work, and he was drunk. So they took the cane he used in the movie and propped him up on it. <laughs> wow, this is Crawford. So they sort of, so they planted the cane, and they sort of leaned him on it, and he stood there, and they yelled "action!" and the cane slipped out from under him, and he fa- he must have fallen through three or four sets, knocking walls over. And, he's, and the the crew was following him, trying to catch him, but then they finally gave up, and he hit the floor, and they took him home. Not a small man, by the way. Oh wow! Who else could knock over three or four sets? He just, he just hit the wall. He'd hit the wall, and the whole thing would come down, and he'd keep falling into the next wall. You oh, know? no. Was, yeah, then I had to take him to Universal for an interview, and I had this tiny Fiat. <laughs> I picked him up at a motel where there were six empty gin bottles out in front of the door. Wow. And uh, I don't know if he had it delivered, and he I had to squeeze him into the car and again, he was so drunk, he breathed. He was breathing and steamed up the windows. I could not see. Wow. And I took him, took him to the interview. But you know what? He was perfect in the interview. You wouldn't know he had a drink. Really? And when it was over. Yeah. Well, these guys, they're pros. I mean, then I had to uh, drag him back to the car and stuff him in. And, uh, <laughs> but anyway, but it was great to have come from New York and work. At Paramount, uh, you know, uh, I saw them shooting uh, uh, Godfather 2 and Chinatown. Oh, oh my God, you were there for Chinatown and Godfather 2? Wow. 
Yeah, they were shooting them at the same time, and I had my little studio bike, and uh, I would just disappear for a couple hours in the office. <laughs> now, when you're working on uh, Terror in the Wax Museum, and you've got all these crotchety uh, uh, 30s and 40 stars, besides Crawford, who was the worst? Was Rory Meland hard? No, he was a pro. Uh, wow. John Carradine. John Carradine was a little difficult. Wow. But he had great stories. He told, you know, he was a sailor, you know, I mean, into sailing, and he talked about how he taught Bogart how to sail. But see, again, most of the uh, audience don't know who these people are. Bogart and John Carradine and... I would argue, but, uh, well, I did I did David Carradine's last interview before he went to, unfortunately, Thailand, you know, and, and Bangkok and, you know, history. Wow, I... I hope your interview had nothing to do with him. Anyway, <laughs> it hadn't been printed yet, so he might have preemptively done it. But I suggest, I suggest from what I heard, it was a Thailand lady boy, not not my article that did it. But uh, I have to ask, working on this because you were working with some real classic people, Elsa Lanchester, yeah. the Bride of Frankenstein. Talk about her. Oh, she she was great. She was again. You know, a, a lot of them love to tell old stories, wow. you know? and she was sweet, and she had a great sense of humor, and uh, you know, and uh, who else was in this thing? I, again, I don't know. I have to look up the uh, obituary. I, I got it for you. Hey, hold on, smartass. You had Marisa Evans. You worked with Doctor uh, uh, Zayas himself. Yes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, see. Uh, you know, the thing was, when I shot my scene, I was completely alone. <laughs> but during the rest uh, during the rest of the shoot, I was on the set, and I wow. talked to these people. And uh, so, like I said, that was a great experience to really get to know uh, the film business and be at, at Paramount. And, you know, as a kid in Ohio, you couldn't, I couldn't even imagine this kind of stuff. Wow, uh, wow, wow, wow. So that was pretty exciting. And then I did, uh, the second film I did was while I was working at Paramount, which was a movie that uh, nobody saw, including my parents, <laughs> called uh, Sheila Levine is Dead and Living in New York. I've heard of that. I've seen that. I've seen that on TCM at least once. What did you do on that? Um, I'm not, I worked nine weeks, but, you know, there was like this group of that, like a little ensemble and you know, we just improvised our shit. We were like, uh, it was a recording studio, and we worked there. But, you know, it was nine weeks. Uh, I was getting hardly anything for the uh, production job. And uh, I was here. I, it was SAG minimum at the, in those days seemed like a lot of money. And so, uh, but, but that movie was uh, chaos. Star was difficult. And, no, but, but by the, the star, do you mean the forgotten woman who played Sheila Levine or Roy mm -hmm. Scheider, who the same year did Jaws, which opened today, yeah. 23 years ago? Wow. See, only someone like you would know that <laughs> and really care. But, uh, Ouch. Yeah, she she was, uh, I thought she was, but she was so difficult, Jeannie Berlin, and, you know, uh, but uh, look, you know, got uh, the crew, got, got the crew. She deserved apparently, you know. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know. Look, that's how I got the job. I knew her, and she, you know, sort of pushed me in there, which was great. And uh, again, nine weeks work. Uh, that was uh, that was a lot. So. She's still working today, even though I never heard of her. I mean, she was an inherent vice. She's got, right. you know. Yeah, yeah, there was some uh, cable show she did, and then she sort of is coming back uh, at 68. It's a little <laughs> late to come back, but, you know, I'm still, in, I'm still waiting to get there. Ready to come back. <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah, so, you know, and look, I had uh, the most difficult uh, thing was I worked with Barbara Streisand on A Star is Born. Holy oh, my crap. God. Wow. Do you know she cut? And, did she cut you out of the movie? Because I know like two actresses in that film who are cut from the film on Streisand's orders. I, I, well, I wasn't specifically cut by on her orders, but I was specifically directed by her. 
Wow. And the director didn't want her directing me. You know, it's one of those things you become the victim. You're like the schmuck in the middle. Yeah. And Barbara Streisand was not talking to the director. And so uh, the scene was just me, uh, Streisand, and Paul Mazursky. And, uh, but the great thing was they shot it at that time. It was called the Aquarius Theater on Sunset. Wow. And here was this entire theater with just a few crew guys and me. I called my wife who came running over and we had a concert. She sang about six songs that they recorded. Evergreen was one of them. Wow. So that was amazing. Yeah. So the thing with her and the director, the director would say to me, okay, you come from the left side, come in, get between them, say your lines and go out on the right side. And I say, okay. He'd yell action. I'd come out from the left side. She would yell, cut, cut. What are you doing? I said, well, I'm coming from. No, no. <laughs> I want you to come from, come from the right side. I said, but the director said, no. You do. I did what she did. The director yelled, <laughs> cut. What are you doing? I said, I'm coming from the right side. He said, this went on all day. Wow, man. So well, that was end, Mark Rydell, right? No, no. That was uh, Frank Pearson. Wow. He wrote. Uh, and got an Oscar for uh, Dog Day Afternoon. Uh. And, you know, look, nobody can direct Streisand. So they had me coming from the left, from the right, from the ceiling, from the front, from the back. So uh, there was no continuity. Nothing matched. So all you heard was my off-camera voice a couple times. Otherwise, it looked like I just would uh, magically appear on one side. And disappear on the other. <laughs> so, so no one but could. Again, she she tells Barbara the, Streisand. She'll tell the director what to do, right? <laughs> yeah, boy. Oh, absolutely. Tell oh him God. what to do. Yeah. You know, there's nothing like working on a movie where the star and the director don't talk to each other, and they talk through the actors. You know. Wow. So, uh, but but that, anyway. that doesn't but it, that's hard on you though. Doesn't it make it tough? You know. Oh, <laughs> you can't satisfy both of them, you know. Uh, so if I did what one asked me to do, the other one was angry. So that's why, like I said, they wound up cutting it because I had they had me coming in from all directions, and uh, it was just one of those things. But it was again, I always look at those things as great experiences to hear her sing, uh, to work with her. And the amazing thing was about a month later, my entire family came from Ohio to visit. We went to a restaurant in Beverly Hills and Barbara Streisand was there. And uh, I thought, she's not going to know. So I went up to her and she turned around and looked at me. She she said, hi, Sandy. Well, my entire family just about... My entire family just about crapped themselves. I introduced my family. By now, I'd overstayed my uh, welcome, but I thought, I'm just going to keep... This is my mother and my brother and my father and my kids. And so at least they had a story for when they got back to Toledo. That Sandy day. knows Barbara. Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Barbara, she knows you personally. This is unbelievable. Wait till I <laughs> Oh my God! Shimashigana. <laughs> and John Peters was the producer, so he would show up and he'd play with her hair, fuss and pull the curls, and then leave. And that's what he did. Wow! Now, how was Chris Christopherson? Were you there at all when John Peters was supposedly threatening to beat him up? No, no. Like I said, I was uh, the scene was just me. Uh, Streisand and Paul Mazursky, who I was thrilled to meet and talk to and work with because I was a fan of uh, of his uh, films. He was a great writer and director. An amazing writer and director. I mean, if you look at... I, we were just talking about Down and Out in Beverly Hills, how great it is. And, oh, you know. Yeah, Bob Carroll, Ted and Alice. And, Two Days you know, in the Valley, just, uh, you know. And uh, An Unmarried Woman was great. Wow, wow, wow. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was one of those guys who just... I was so glad he got reappreciated with went down and out. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. He uh, Somehow he and Mel Brooks uh, later, towards the end, became buddies. And uh, when Mel was doing uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm, he had Paul Mazursky and Rudy DeLuca, who was one of his co-writers. Oh, I know Rudy well. I, I know of Rudy well. He co-wrote Life Stinks and he co-wrote Transylvania 6-5000. 
Yeah, and he co-wrote, uh, I think he co-wrote High Anxiety. I think he did too. Barry Levinson. Can you believe it? Barry Levinson of Rain Man fame co-wrote a Mel Brooks movie. Yeah, he was a collaborator with Mel for a while. And, uh, you know, yeah, that was to go from that to <laughs> And Justice for All. You know? Oh, yeah. And uh, all the other stuff that uh, he did. But, uh, you know, Mel works well with uh, collaborators. Wow. And, uh, someone to bounce off of. So it was great working with him because he let me improvise and, you know, uh, uh, so I had that freedom. And he would just call me like... Uh, Sandy, I'm doing a movie. I want you to be in it. Come, this is the part. Come, visit me on the set. We'll talk about it. And he would have me come, and I'd hang out. And it, again, it was uh, it was great. You know, wow. was, uh, you know, again, it's that thing of, uh, I always thought of myself as the kid from Toledo. And when I went to meet Mel Brooks in his office, which from the door entering his office to his desk was like a block. Wow. And you, I would walk, and I kept, and he'd be looking at me, and I thought, when am I going to get there? He's looking <laughs> at me. He's going to change his mind. And we talked, and the best thing was, I made him laugh. <laughs> so, it, how really, did, by mean, the way, how you know, did you make Mel Brooks laugh? I got to know. Uh, besides taking my pants off, um, <laughs> it was. No, you know what? We it was just conversation. Uh, he didn't talk about. He told me a little bit about. It was high anxiety about the film and this, and uh, he laughed. And then he said to me, "You know, you were here for a small part. I like you. I'm going to give you a bigger small part." So that's what, uh, you know, I never had to audition for him. They would wow. just call, you know, for baseballs or for history of the world. Uh, and so, you know, and then I run into him out here a lot and. Uh, uh, you know, it's amazing. What is he? Ninety two. His yeah. energy is—he's still sharp, and he's, you know, still on top of it. That's really but, exciting. Uh, That's so exciting. I mean, uh, whatever. Talk about space balls for a minute, because that was just on TBS the other day. You know? Yeah, I just—I just got a residual for a nickel, so uh, <laughs> I can tell it was on. Space balls was uh, was a lot of fun. It was a little stressful at first, you know, I played the, uh, yeah, I played the doctor and, and as we played around with it, uh, he, Mel said that he, he loved it. My inflection sounded like Groucho. So he <laughs> sends me to makeup and he wants them to make me up like Groucho Marx. <laughs> and I said, you know, I said, now there's a lot of pressure for me to do a great impersonation. I don't do an impersonation. I can do an inflection. So luckily, uh, Rick Moranis came to my rescue, and we both talked Mel out of the Groucho thing. <laughs> and uh, uh, so uh, they, they were again. He let us improvise a lot. So I, uh, during the golf scene, I mean, it was just the one scene. I said to Mel, I had an idea for a line. What about when uh, uh, I leave with the uh, caddy? I say to him, uh, I'm going to go home and work on my putts. <laughs> Mel loved the line. He laughed and he said, I like it so much, I'm going to have to give it to Rick Moranis. <laughs> wow, <laughs> man. <laughs> well, by the way, he, he said, Look, he is the star. And, right. you know, to end the scene, you got to. I said, Okay. I said, So if I come up with something else, oh, anything. You know what I mean? So I come back to him later and I, I had the idea to when the screen goes black. And then it comes back up, and I'm there nuzzling and making out with the nurse. Uh, <laughs> Who played the nurse, by the way? Who was the nurse? Brenda Strong. Wow. She she was like, I forgot the name of that uh, show that Mark Cherry created with all the women. Uh, oh, Desperate made. Housewives. Desperate. She was the voice, wasn't she, on Desperate Housewives? Yes, she, no. she, she was, yes, she was the voice. So I convinced Mel, uh, so I got to nuzzle her and stick wow. my nose into her cleavage. Good and, work uh, to get up in that pre-Me Too era. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'd mess it up. We had to do it 12, uh, 15 times. <laughs> I kept lighting a cigarette after every other day. But, uh, 
So again, it was fun, you know. Uh, he's the, uh, you know, the thing that he opens it up to creativity, and he listens, and ever the, the the whole blackout thing when the screen goes black in Spaceballs was the cinematographer's idea. Really? And so, yeah. So, like I said, it's like uh, you know, he uh, when we were doing History of the World, he called me and he said, "Do you want to meet Richard Pryor? I'm going to bring him to the." studio and show him around and i i was there and so i met uh, prior and he was showing him the sets uh, to do the, uh, the role and then uh was it four or five days a week later uh, prior set himself on fire oh that was and, the free basing uh, incident so the i when you watch that movie it seems like yeah. gregory hines is being forced to imitate richard prior and that's why yeah, he wow. was he was literally brought in at the last minute. Wow. So I guess the easy, easiest I don't know what he told Gregory Hines specifically, but again, you know, I would sit around to sit around in a circle with Dom DeLuise and Howie Morris and these guys dressed as Roman soldiers, <laughs> Al Shecky Green, it was hysterical, <laughs> you know. And so um yeah, so Gregory Hines literally came in at the last minute. Amazing. Uh, uh, just amazing. Yeah. And and uh, originally, in History of the World, I played Albert Einstein. No! Two and a half, oh, they did that's... a two and a half... Yeah, they did a two and a half hour makeup, you know, with the hair and the mustache. <sighs> Mel was going to play Hitler, and there was another guy <sighs> playing Sigmund Freud. And it was oh, a wow. musical number. <sighs> And I don't know, they had doubles, and we were going to be skating, and we had to sing. I, and I am a terrible, terrible singer. And so uh, I didn't tell that to Mel. It's like they ask you, can you ride a horse? Oh, yeah. Oh. So I, so we, I was in the recording studio with Jackie Mason, who was there to do his song. And uh, like I said, I sang so badly, the uh, John Morris, who's Mel. I had to literally stand next to me and sing with me in my ear so I wouldn't uh, be flat and off key. Wow. And then he wound up cut, cutting the whole scene. And then oh, he called me and said, I, he said, I cut the scene, but I'm doing the Last Supper scene with Jesus. I want you in that. And that was with John Hurt. John Hurt is so, Jesus. They claim John Hurt did the movie for free. I guess he would, he would sneak into several different Mel Brooks movies, including Spaceballs at the ending. I don't know as far as free, but he, uh, um, you know, he played Jesus and in in uh, uh, in history of the world, and uh, we had adjoining dressing rooms, wow. and so when we finished, I went to mine, and he was in his. And there was just a curtain, and he tapped on the curtain, and he said, "Care for a drink?" Uh. I said, "Sure." I I opened the uh, wall between our dressing rooms. And I was like ankle deep in empty booze bottles. Wow! I rock and roll, yeah. man. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So uh, I don't remember what day we left our dressing rooms, but it was, uh, <laughs> again, you know, the opportunity to work with these people, you know, and My sit God. and talk with them, and yeah. You know, uh, well, we have to. Yeah, look, Mel, but we have to Mel, know, Sam. You know, really, what does the elephant man no, drink? I'm sorry. Pardon me? What was the elephant oh, man every, drinking? Uh, what wasn't he drinking? <laughs> <laughs> there, there was wine. There were wine bottles and, you know, gin and <laughs> vodka. Thank God he had vodka, you know, because I don't drink the other stuff. Right, right. And we just sat there and talked until they knocked on our door security and, you know, said, get the hell out of here. Wow. <laughs> wow, yeah. that's amazing, Sandy. And what, so yeah, Hurt was a nice guy? Yes, he was. He was, I, you know, again, great sense of humor and someone you could sit and drink and talk to, you know. He wow. did, there was no pretense to him that he wasn't pretentious or, and he, look, he loved Mel like everyone else and was <sighs> thrilled to get, look, Mel made him a star, you know, with <sighs> Elephant Man. Yeah, oh, I keep forgetting Mel produced that. Yeah, and Bancroft was in it, Mel produced it. So, uh, Look, anyone who works with Mel always wants to come back and work with them again. Wow. And, uh, I, I'm thrilled, you know, I got to do three pictures. Uh, 
We went to a uh, memorial service for a friend of ours, uh, mine and Mel, and Mel got up to speak, and I was, like, sitting near close to the stage. So Mel said the guy who passed away, Ira, he said, I think he was in uh, the most of my films. He said, now that he's gone, he looks at me, he said, I think now Sandy Helberg has been, been in the most of my film. I said, please don't curse me. Uh, I don't want to be the one who's been in the most. I'll be dead, and then some other guy will take my place. You know? But uh, he uh, he was just a, 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 a... We ran into him in Malibu when my older son was a little boy. Uh, I don't know, like seven. And uh, Mel goes over to my son and we're standing off the side and he asks my son, listen, between you and I, who do you like better, your mother or your father? And my son was shocked. He couldn't, who would ask you that kind of a question? And he started to back up and, and running and Mel's chasing him. I promise it'll just be between you and me. And he's yelling, who do you like better, your mother or your father? And my son, Son comes running up to me and he looks up at me and he says, Dad, he's asking me, who do I like better, you or mom? And I said, well, and uh, that was uh, the end of the scene. Now, I loved it and he was hysterical. <laughs> uh, hey, is it true you were the original gopher on the love boat? Yes, I was. Mm -hmm. uh, I... Uh, it, uh, you know, the auditions for that just went on forever and ever. And you'd go in and there'd be 30 guys coming in to read for Gopher and everyone looked different. And uh, so and at that time, again, I had long hair and I had a beard. And so they tell me uh, they tell my agent they're going to make an offer, but they just want me to come back, get my hair cut, shave the beard. But, you know, I got the part. I show up a couple of days later, clean cut, shaven, and I'm sitting in the waiting room. And then walks another actor who looks exactly like me. And the two of us are sitting out there waiting. We go in, we come out, we go in, we come out. They finally uh, gave me the job. And I had just gotten married. And I said, I didn't have much of a honeymoon. Can I take my wife? And I thought, this guy, this guy's got some balls. What do you think? You're lucky you got the job. Now you want to take your wife on a cruise? So our cruise was to Ensenada. I didn't get to go to Thailand or Europe. We just circled Ensenada. And uh, so it didn't get picked up. Uh, we did a two-hour movie. Uh, um, you know, it was Tom Bosley and Cloris Leachman, who was... Uh, I, she's a great actress, but she's out of her mind. Oh, yeah. Cloris Leachman? <laughs> Oh, and he, Nurse yeah. Diesel has to be out of her mind. <laughs> oh, well, you know, she, uh, uh, you know, I had a, was working with uh, she, Tom Bosley and Cloris Leachman played husband and wife. So I have a scene with them. The director yells cut. She goes over to the director, and I hear her saying, my son was much better than he is. You know, I don't know why you didn't hire my son. Oh, you know? no. <laughs> really? Yeah, so... So there I was again, the schmuck in the middle. She doesn't like me because her son didn't get the job, but I got the job. And so she, uh, and then, like I said, years later, there we are working with Mel Brooks together. Wow. But that, so anyhow, so, so, so what happened was they, ABC didn't pick up the pilot. Uh, it was a two hour thing with Florence Hender, Henderson and Gabe Kaplan. Wow. What a personality he was. And, for reals? Uh, for reals? Well, or, or were you being sarcastic? Not at all. This guy, you know, uh, if you said, how you doing? It took him a few minutes to uh, figure out. He brought an acting teacher. He brought an acting teacher with him. He really did. Really? An acting coach. Yes, he did. I think other than Cotter, this was probably the only other thing at that time he had done. Wow. So I couldn't bring my wife, but he could bring an acting teacher. My <laughs> wife did. <laughs> wow. My wife did come. She came and spent four days vomiting on the boat. So, uh, oh, God. Well, I can see where they but, brought Fred uh, Grandy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, then, uh, so then, like, uh, literally almost, I don't know, almost a year later, I was doing another show uh, for uh, the show called The Lorenzo 
and Henrietta Music Show. Was that Lorenzo, Lorenzo Music from uh, from the Mary Tyler Moore Show, the, the Carlton the Dorman? Yeah. Wow. Oh, yes, wow. This, this, was an, this was an MTM show. It was a variety show. And so uh, then they said they're going to do a second love boat, and MTM wouldn't let me. I had a contract as a writer and actor in on that show. It was a, a sketch show, a variety show. I understand you guys had Murphy Dunn on the show. On yes. The show. Yeah. yeah so, uh, that Mur Murphy and I met on that show, and we became writing partners. Really? Uh, and, yeah. And Richard Lewis was on that show as a writer, and that's how I know him for all these years. Wow. And so, so MTM would not let me out of my contract for two weeks. And they said <sighs> they would sue me and this and that. And look, hey, you take that seriously. And like I said... The rest is history. You think I would get a thank you note from Fred Grandy? No. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> Holy cow, a 10-year yeah. run, by the way. A 10-year run. Yeah. That's and, a and long time for on, anything, man. The show I was on had a 10-day run. It was, <laughs> it, was strip, it was a strip show. It was on five days a week. And after three weeks, they canceled the show. And uh, so, you know, like I said, that's just the way that showbiz. That's I don't out. want. I, I don't want you to feel bad, but I've been to Bernard Copel's house, and it's bigger than the director of The Empire Strikes Back's house. He lived on yeah, the street from the Jackson Five. <laughs> he did. Look, you know, but you know, there's so many stories that are like that. I have a friend who did the pilot for Laverne and Shirley. Cindy Williams did not want to play the part, so the friend of mine played. Uh, I guess Shirley, and then the pilot got picked up, and Cindy Williams said, "You know, I think I will do the show." <sighs> so the other actress was out. You know, that's just the way. Who was the I other? Don't know if you ever heard the, who was the other actress? Uh, the other actress. Uh, her name was uh, Liberty Williams. Oh, that was Liberty Williams. Yeah. I, I could not, Jeff, you know who Liberty Williams is. I could not find her for love or money about 10 years ago. Liberty Williams did the, was the voice of uh, uh, Jaina on Super Friends. Oh my God. Yeah, that's right. And oh. I could not find her. I found Michael Bell, who was married to Victoria Carol Bell and still is, thank goodness, a fellow groundling with you. But Liberty uh, Williams was in the breeze. I could not find her. Is she still with us? Oh, yeah. I think you can find her on Facebook as Louise. Wow. Louise, huh. Louise Williams. We'll have to try that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, what do you think? When she was born, her parents said, let's see, Liberty's a good name. <laughs> oh, <yeah>. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but you know what? She's great. I love her, and we work together a lot in the Groundling. She, was, she is one of the funniest women, you know, and great-looking. Wow. It's a rare combination. There you go. But but you and her having that hidden horror that you were both the original. I also know the actress who was the original Xena. And it, I mean, oh. the, the idea of waking up in the morning knowing that you are in the zeitgeist, you know? Yeah, yeah, you know. And there was a guy, there are stories like that. This, this other, I don't remember his name. Uh, he had tested for the role of George in Seinfeld. And it was the same thing. They, they, his agent said, I think he got it. I think he got it. Boom. Jason Alexander shows up from New York. Well, to get loose, the rest is history. Oh, and, no. know, this business is littered with, with people who did the pilot but didn't get the series. Oh, yeah. There's Damn. a famous actress named Riff. Well, not, the actress isn't famous, but the famous story of the actress Riff Reagan. Riff Reagan, uh -huh. she starred in the she co-starred in the Buffy the Vampire Slayer pilot as Willow, and oh, they wow. they kept the entire cast except her and just redid all our scenes and the show got picked up. How do you wake up uh -oh. in the morning when you see TV Guide? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, yeah, you get variety and you see a show that you did was picked up, but somehow your name is not in there. But, but you did uh, everything right. You did everything right, and then you were held up. I mean that. I mean that's the that horror. Was, what, uh, the whole cast from the Love Boat, the original Love Boat, was recast. Uh, Dick Van Patten originally played the Doctor. Wow. And uh, there was, uh, and I never heard of the re rest of the cast. The captain was uh, an Australian actor. They found 
the woman, the Cruz, uh, was an actress they found in New York. Again, I had never heard of these people. Wow. And um, Teddy Wilson played the bartender. I don't know if you knew him. He was a, a great character actor. He did everything. He, he passed away. He played uh, the bartender. And then this actor, Joe Sicari, played uh, like the funny waiter. And then there was a married couple who played the entertainers in the lounge, Dick Stahl and his wife, Cash, uh, Catherine Ish. Oh, Dick uh, Stahl! Like, when do you, when, uh, Dick yeah. Shaw, Wendy Shaw's mom. No, no, this is Dick Stahl. Oh, but Dick Stahl, was, okay. Uh, yeah, he was also like a Second City guy, but not the Dick. I know Dick Shaw. I did a movie with him, Hollywood Nights. Was in there. Okay, oh, did you know that Hollywood Nights was Michael Jackson's favorite movie? No, why didn't someone tell me that? He used to watch it repeatedly. Gary Gary Graham couldn't believe it when I told him that too, you know? Oh, if I would have known that, I would have been at uh, his ranch with my pants down. <laughs> well, <you're, laughs> I think you were a little older than he was looking for. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, my son had gone, had gone to his ranch and spent the night when he was like uh, 12 and... Uh, uh, because we knew someone who knew Michael Jackson, and uh, you're doing a bang up job there, her. Dad. <laughs> yeah, and I kept saying, "Are you sure he didn't talk?" He was there when that kid sued, you know, and Macaulay Culkin, and I kept asking him, "Are you sure he didn't touch you anywhere?" That you know, uh, he said Michael Jackson. Uh, he, he did say Michael Jackson took him to his room and showed him his closet. He opened the door, Yikes. and he said, "In the closet." At that time, he wore the black hat, the red shirt, and the black jeans. Uh -huh. There must have been 20, 20 black hats identical, 20 red shirts identical, and 20 black pair of pants identical. Wow. And then he asked, he asked my son, he said, uh, you're, uh, you're Jewish, right? I thought, <laughs> you don't have to be Kreskin to tell what my son is Jewish, you know. <laughs> and he said, yeah. And he said, so what? So, so when you turn 13... You have a Hanukkah, and my son said, "No, it's called a Bar Mitzvah." And so, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, he had, he had uh, his experience with. We uh, he brought back, and we still have him all these souvenirs from the ranch. You know, uh -huh. I mean, imagine you you your house has souvenirs, like your house has a gift shop, and they give you stuff, and you know. And he came home with all these. Uh, what was this place called? It was called Neverland, Neverland Ranch. Ranch. Neverland, yeah, with all this Neverland merchandise, wow. visors, hats, you know. <laughs> uh, but uh, they all have the Never Neverland label on them. <laughs> yes, they were all uh, branded. Oh wow, you know? that's yeah. hilarious! You know, this is actually a great collector's item. You know. <laughs> oh, oh yeah, absolutely. I you know, but uh, so. So that was, uh, uh, you know, the thing with uh, Michael Jackson. And, uh, you know, look, when you're around, you, 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 the people you, you meet, and again, the people you work with, was, uh, were all, was amazing. But he went, my son went to Crossroads, and every two oh, years... Oh, the Crossroads have, School in Santa Monica. Yeah. <laughs> so every two years, they would have a huge variety show to benefit the school. And so for two of those uh, shows, I was uh, one, uh, the writer, one of the writers and the, and, the, and the director. And I'm directing people like Ted Danson, Denzel Washington, wow. Jane Seymour. You know, and I would think to myself, you know, they got to listen to me. I'm the director, you know. And, it, and I, Denzel Washington had just, just did a um, uh, Spike Lee movie. I can't remember which one. And uh, I told him, I said, I don't know why you're wasting your time with Spike Lee. You should be doing comedy sketches. <laughs> uh, and so so he and his wife did a sketch and Ted Danson. And so it was great. You know, again, it was a lot of fun. And uh, I got to work with uh, some Norman Lear. I put him in a sketch. And uh, uh, so, you know, uh, that was uh, that was that. Wow, then, but the, so you directed, but you actually did sketches for the school. Pardon me. You actually directed sketches for that school. 
Yeah, yeah. Wow. And like I said, every two year, every other year, they would have a big benefit variety show, and all the parents were celebrities. Uh, like uh-huh. Norman Lear, Dustin Hoffman, his kid went there when my son went, and so you had access to all these parents, and nobody could say no. You know, it's it's for the school. <laughs> it's for the school. Man. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> You got to do it. I, it, it uh, Julia Louis Dreyfus uh, was going to be in the show, but then she was going to do a scene with Norman Lear, and I. So that was my how I got Norman Lear to do it. And I said, you know, you're going to do the scene with uh, Julia Louis Dreyfus, and he says, well, oh, oh, well, okay. He said, you know, I'm not an actor, but to, I, I'll work with her. And then turns out she couldn't be in the show. She had to go to New York because it was the last season of Seinfeld. <laughs> And so I had to get someone else to fill in. And Norman Lear said to me, you know, she's no, the other woman. He said, she's no Julia Louis-Dreyfus. Ouch. And I said, well, I said, you're no Jerry Seinfeld. <laughs> so we were even. <laughs> and you know what? Uh, again, just uh, yes. so I did this scene. I pre-taped the scene with Julia Louis-Dreyfus and um, Jane Seymour. And it was pretty funny. You know, they both had like season endings. And while one would be talking, I'd have the other actors lean into the, into the shot. And so here they were competing because they were both hyping their last episodes. And it was it was pretty funny. They You just tell, you know, you put two starlet stars, female stars together, and they will talk over each other and at the same time. And, and it was pretty funny. Especially, <laughs> you know, so... Talk about Battle good. of the Giants, though. Did any of them intimidate you as a director? Um, I'm trying to think. No, you know what? They were more nervous than I than I was. You know, to get up and you know, it was, we did the uh, what theater? I think it was the one over there in Westwood where um, the veterans, uh, play, the veterans hospital is. There's a huge theater there. Yeah, I yeah. I saw. I, I saw. Uh, um, um, Ray, Ray, I saw the guy from, uh, um, God almighty, um, Ray Davies play there. Oh, really? Yeah, oh, yeah. big theater. So, so they were, ner- they were nervous about, you know, working, doing sketches in front of a live audience. And, uh, so they, they trusted me and that was their big mistake. But anyhow, it was a great <laughs> show. I had fun and, uh, and that was it. And so, you know, uh, okay. Sandy, talk about the formation of the Groundlings. Well, when I first got out here from New York uh, back in the 1800s, uh, <laughs> uh, I, I had a partner in New York, and we did a two-man comedy act, you know. And uh, so um, after a while, it's like anything else, it was time to, to go to L.A. and see what's going on. And so I get to L.A., and someone mentions... They have a friend, Gary Austin, who passed away last year. And uh, he has this little group, the Groundlings. So when I went, they were, we, uh, the theater was on Oxford in uh, East Hollywood. Wow. Terrible neighborhood. And I went <laughs> to meet Gary Austin. And uh, I said, look, I, I do improv- I, I've been doing improvisation for a long time. I'd love to be in the group. And he's looking at me. He's saying, he says, I said, how many seats does this theater hold? He said, 45. I said, really? It looks much smaller. It turns out it was 32. Otherwise, wow. I wouldn't have done it. And then uh, he looks at me. He says, well, are you interested in being in the Groundlings? I said, yeah. He said, do you have $45? I said, yeah. He said, you're in. And that was it. <laughs> you bought your way in. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, at that time, there were like 10 people was the whole cast. There were nights where we would all be on stage, and there were more people on stage than were that that watching. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so nobody had heard of the Groundlings. That was the beginning, and Lily Tomlin and Lauren Michaels came to that theater, and uh, they uh, picked out uh, Lorraine Newman and I did a scene together, and they uh, for uh, Lily's variety show they hired me, Lorraine Newman. This other guy, Archie Hahn. Archie Hahn, the, and, from the Juicy yeah. Fruits, Phantom of the Paradise. Yes, yeah, they hired him. 
And so we did uh, Lily Tomlin's variety show. And, uh, you know, so, and that was the beginning of Saturday Night Live. And uh, again, you know, I'm thinking about it. I, I don't want to set myself up as a victim, but the character I did in the Groundlings for that scene was a, a real Jewish guy from New York. <laughs> and so we. <laughs> So we're uh, going to shoot the scene for Lily's show, and Lauren Michaels goes over and talks to Lily and her manager and her partner. He doesn't like my character; it's too Jewish. So they oh they get God. into they what? get in again. Hey, they told me to show up here. What do you mean? I, and so they get into a little bit of a heated discussion, and Lily and her partner they like my character, and that's why they hired me. Lauren Michaels didn't get his way. And uh, he, he, ever since then, he never liked me. And oh, that my God. Because, because I don't like him either. But, you know, he, uh, I was too Jewish for him. And he's a Jew. It's uh, like, oh, can you tone it down a bit? Can you tone the Jew yeah. down a bit? <laughs> Look, you know what? Uh, Michael is not even his, uh, his last name is like Lauren Leibowitz or something. Whoa. <laughs> that doesn't sound Hollywood, but it does. No, but. I think he was a self-loathing Jew, you know? Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, <laughs> I mean, when Phil Hartman uh, joined uh, Saturday Night Live, he and I uh, did a lot of stuff together. Scenes and he, and Phil told me he would occasionally bring up uh, my name to Lauren, and he said to me, "What did you do to him?" <laughs> I said, wow. "No, I, I, I'm a Jew. He doesn't like me." And so, you know, John, John Lovitz would mention uh, me to him, but uh, look, that that was not the only show on TV. I didn't care, and uh, screw him. <laughs> yeah, but, but plus, the, what, he's always got a career for Sarah Live, but all he did was rip off National Lampoon's entire cast. Yeah, that's, uh, that, well, you know, it, uh, it started with, uh, he produced a couple of Lily Tomlin variety shows, and then, yeah, he hired the Second City and Lampoon, you know, Lampoon was doing the show in New York at the time, so he just... Uh, sucked up most of those people, but hey, it was, he'd go to Second City, and then he started coming to the Groundlings, and it changed the whole dynamic of the Groundlings. Wow. It used to be, we're doing this because we like it, and we have fun. Then it became, we're doing this because we hope Lauren Michaels is here, and we'll get on Saturday Night Live. Oh, no. And ah. it, became, it became competitive and backstabbing, and I think I was the only Groundling who knew there was no way I was going to get on the show, so I didn't care. <laughs> and uh, uh, So, yeah, it became, and you see how many groundlings they do. Uh, so it's, it's still very competitive. You know? They all want to be on Saturday Night Live. Well, can you talk about Lorraine and Phil Hartman a little bit? I mean, they're, they're kind of legendary. Yeah, uh, Lorraine and I, we did... Uh, uh, the scene we did, she did her uh, 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 stewardess, you know, Sherry, she, she played. That was the conflict. I was a real New York Jew, and she was like this real Gentile, blonde-haired <laughs> Presbyterian. And, so, and we were going to a marriage counselor, and, uh, and it was a good scene, you know. And like I said, she was there a short time before she went to New York. And uh, then Phil came in a little later, and um, he was such a good guy. He and I, the whole, off and on for 10 years, he and I in the theater would sit in the back of the dressing room, and he and I would, sh it was just the two of us in this one dressing room. Everybody else up front, there were like 10 people, and he and I would just sit in the back there. The stuff that we talked about for the whole was funnier than anything you see in the show. <laughs> so, but he came uh, and he told me and my son this, and I was shocked. I didn't know. He said, he came to see a show. He heard about this group. And he said to my son, he said, I saw your dad up there. He said he was one of the funniest people I'd ever seen. Wow. And he said. A high compliment from him, by the way. Yeah. And he said, I, he said, I want to do that. And, uh, you know, but Phil was such a sweet guy and 
so funny and just, you know, the thing I had said at his memorial, I said, when you worked with Phil on stage, you always felt safe. You know, you knew it was all going to work out. The scene would be funny. You know, you just uh, put your trust in him and just go back and forth. And, you know, he, uh, yeah, you know, the thing with Phil was also his, his uh, death happened. <laughs> was on my birthday. Oh, uh, man. Yeah. Horrible. Yeah. Hey, you know what? That's almost as bad as my mother passing away on my anniversary. I can on top that. I can top that. He, he can top that. My dad died on my yeah. birthday. Oh, well. Hey, look, you know, at least you have, you know, uh, you blow out the candles and then you, <laughs> you know... Uh, yeah, but, like I didn't have but, enough uh, family issues being the middle of five. My dad had to drop dead on my birthday. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so Phil, you know, finally joined the group, and it was the first time he'd ever done. You know, he was an artist. He did a lot of uh, album covers. Wow! Uh, yeah, for, that's what his brother was for, telling us. Yeah, yeah, he did a lot of album covers, and he really didn't hadn't done. He just thought he would try this. And he, of course, he was great. And then towards the end, while he was in the Groundlings for years, he was thinking about giving it up. Uh, and then he got Saturday Night Live. And he was originally hired just as a writer. But again, he was so good, they uh, used him as an actor. Wow. And, uh, <laughs> so, yeah, so when I woke up on that birthday morning and I turned on the TV and the, and the news would give those teases and say, Comedy icon passes away. Comedy, I'm thinking Milton Berle, Sid Caesar. You know, I cannot imagine that that's who they were talking about. That's right. They're and, not telling you because know, they want to keep you watching. Exactly. Right. And it, you know, it was just unimaginable that that's who it was and that that's what happened to him. You know, that's not something you read about or you see on a dateline or, uh, you know, but to have that happen to your friend, uh, you just, like I said, it's still, it's still, it's one of those things, it's almost like the Kennedy assassination. You just sort of never quite get over it, you know? Yeah, I, I did an Entertainment Weekly photo shoot with Phil in the murder house, so I knew, I knew, since I'd spent the whole day there, I knew what every nook and cranny looked like, so it was pretty horrific. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it was, you know, like I said, but, uh, thank goodness his kids are grown up and, uh, well taken care of and, uh, what are you going to do? He uh, left quite a, uh, he left quite a legacy. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because even when he tried to, he tried to get Lauren to bring you back, he wouldn't do it. He tried what? You said even when he would bring you up to Lauren to try and get you on the show, Michaels wouldn't do it? Yeah. No. No. I was too, I was too, I was too Jewish. <laughs> <laughs> you know, wow. he, kept say, he kept saying that about me. You would think I, I was dressed like a Hasidic Jew with a black hat, a black suit. Yeah, it was just like, okay, I'll, yeah, I'll just wear my yarmulke. Well, Lorraine, <laughs> right, Lorraine Newman was Jewish, you know, and John Lovitz was Jewish. I think it took him a couple years to discover that, gee, Jews are funny. You know? <laughs> uh, Certainly by the time I mean, Mike Myers was, came along. <laughs> yeah, th there was a joke, I don't remember what it was. Uh, it's something like Germans said, you know, I don't know why... Uh, people think we're not funny. You know, I don't know exactly who is funny. And the uh, the answer was, well, you killed six million of the funniest people ever. And uh, <laughs> that again, I don't, I don't look. You know, I can make jokes about the Holocaust because my parents were Holocaust survivors. Wow. So um, yeah, so uh, you know. I was born in Germany, and, uh, you know, when we came to this country, I was about a year old, a woman met us from uh, the uh, Jewish Association, and uh, she asked, what's the baby's name? And my father said, Shmuel Moshe. <laughs> and the, the, the woman looked at him and said, not in this country. Ooh. And she... She gave me the name Sandy. I don't know if she had a bird. Wow. Or a How cool is that? You know, it, it, 
wasn't enough. I came from Germany, and I was this short little Jew with a big nose and big ears and big <laughs> hair and glasses. And the school I went to, again, there was a lot of anti-Semitism. And oh. uh, there were maybe two Jews in my school, and I used to get harassed and, you know, uh, called kike and this and that. And again, I was like four feet tall. The only way I could get girls and not get beat up was by being funny. And uh, so these guys used to call me Hitler. And they would call my house. My father would answer. And oh, no. They would ask for, they would ask for Hitler. Oh, no. And, uh, oh, my God. Oh, my father was so... I said, but look, Dad, that means they like me. <laughs> oh, no. Me, what, are you, what are you, stupid? <laughs> <laughs> I said, yeah, yeah, they call me Hitler. That means they like me. So, uh, so, so I, you know, again, uh, when I say I was like an alien, it was like from another planet uh, growing up in Toledo. Uh, <laughs> just, and so when I moved to New York, right out of high school, I get to New York City and I see, look, there are more Jews here. Oh, They're yeah. All oh. over the place. I was home. I was home. I was walking down the street yelling, are you a Jew? I'm a Jew. Look at all the Jews. I didn't know that many Jews. And, and, and then you discovered all the bakeries the there, too, right? You could get bagels and lots of cream there. cheese, man. Oh, the delis, you know. The I mean, delis. Toledo, Ohio. They, they had three bagels a week shipped in from New York. And, uh, <laughs> and that was it. But uh, So, yeah, I really love New York, and we go back a lot. And we have a little apartment there, and... Uh, you know, that's where, for me, that's where I grew up because Toledo was just, I was scared. I was always scared in Toledo and uh, New York, I felt at home. And that's when I started doing, I started with some stand up and then doing improvisation. We had a little club. We always worked in the village. Uh, my uh, partner, Tony D'Elia and I, we did a two man act and, uh, this little club gave us the room in the back, and that's where we worked every night. Awesome. And we came out to, came out to L.A. and, uh, you know, did the comedy store and places like that. Where, where did you, um, where did you, when did you meet uh, Rob Reiner? Uh, Rob Reiner also. <clears throat> he and uh, Eve Branstein, who cast uh, Spinal Tap, right. uh, came, to see, came to see the Groundlings, and I got a call from my agent that Rob Reiner wanted to talk to me. And I went to his <laughs> office and, uh, Harry Shear was there and Michael McKeon and Chris Guest. And, uh, they were all there. And we just, again, because, you know, the movie was improvised. There really wasn't any script. Right. Right. So we talked and, and talked for a while. And again, you know, uh, thank God I'm a likable guy. Rob liked me. <laughs> and, uh, so, so, so they told me the part that I was going to play. <laughs> Angelo and Di, so, Di, Mabello, Di Mamentabello. Where did he come up with these crazy names, man? <laughs> I, I don't know, but, but the thing was, uh, that wasn't the part I was hired for. Oh! So I get to the, I get to the location, and Rob tells me uh, the character, I think his name was Artie. Uh, Artie Fufkin, that was Paul Schaefer. <laughs> yes. Paul Schaefer wasn't able to do the movie. <laughs> <laughs> last minute. No, he was, at the last minute, he decided he could do the movie. <laughs> so, so I wound up with that other part, with that little tiny part, as opposed to the other one that I thought I was auditioning for. But again, you know, it was a lot of fun. Fran Drescher was in that scene. And, wow. Um, I can't think of, what was the English guy from... Uh, uh, oh, the, the Jeffersons. Avengers? No, no, the English guy from from the Avengers. Oh, oh Patrick yeah. McNee. Patrick McGee, yeah. yeah. No, no, McNee. Yeah, Patrick yeah. McNee. He was the owner of the yeah. Death or uh, the the uh, the record the, label, the record company, Polymer yeah. Records. <laughs> right. <laughs> yes, right. And again, you know, because everything was improvised uh, in the uh, Spinal Tap uh, special DVD, I had a lot more to do. I improvised a lot of stuff, but. Again, people go on and on, so like I am, and they, you know, uh, have to cut a lot out, but they have a lot to choose from. Right. So, oh, you won't believe this. I'm here in my studio, 
and my wife of 43 years just brought me a cup of coffee. Oh, wow. Wow. Yeah, my I studio just, is actually <laughs> my, my car. <laughs> <laughs> no, I just brought Patrick no. a cup of coffee. He did. It was delicious. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, but you probably don't get to sleep with him, right? <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Only when it's really cold and Jeff is really, really lucky. <laughs> <laughs> I could do uh, so much better than Jeff. <laughs> I think I'll crank the air conditioner or put that fan on. It's getting hot in here, man. <laughs> <laughs> we need a hose in the red, anyway, don't you? <laughs> and she brought down our two-year-old granddaughter, who we are raising now. Oh, congratulations. I heard a grandpa, and I thought even your wife well, and you wouldn't be wild enough to call each other that. <laughs> Well, my, you know, we've been together, for, uh, married 43 years, and we've had this baby. Look, people, uh, I told people, you just can't imagine at my age that we're I'm still, uh, uh, you know, uh, fertile, you know. But uh, actually, he's our son's daughter, and uh, we're raising her because they're not able to. So we are opposed to her going into foster care. Or being adopted. No, that's what you're there for, Pop Pop. You know, in fact, let me ask you. So you got married in 75, the year Jaws came out. Right. Give me a right. Roy right. Scheider right. story. Right. You worked with Roy Scheider and Sheila Levine is dead and living in New York. Give us a Roy Scheider story. Did you do the movie before okay. Jaws came out? Yeah, uh, well, I don't remember. Uh, actually, no, it was probably before because he wouldn't have done it then. When I did Lily Tomlin's special, Richard Dreyfus was the guest. Wow. He had just finished Jaws. It hadn't come out. And he did nothing but complain. He said, I did this shark movie. It's going to be a bomb. It's going to ruin my career. So he oh, no. Around, and he said, I did a fish movie. And the director was this kid. And, uh, <clears throat> you know. But, uh, oh, so the Roy Scheider thing. So Jeannie Berlin had amazing control of this movie, right. you know, because they wanted her so badly. So uh, uh, the director was this, uh, she wanted another, a different actor for that role. The uh, director insisted on Roy Scheider. She and Roy Scheider did not get along, to say the least. You know, Roy Scheider is like a professional. He shows up. He, he knows the words. But now he's working with a woman who makes her own words up. Oh, no. You know? And it just, it didn't gel. And it got to one point where uh, the door was open to, to her closet and there was a scene in her bedroom. And she, he just couldn't take it anymore. And she said something and turned her back to her, him. And he took his foot and put it on her ass, pushed her into the closet, <laughs> shut the door, and walked off the set. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Is that, heard a, is that in the movie? You never heard a crew <laughs> applaud. <I say. laughs> but, you know, uh, but, you know, he was a very straight guy, a real pro. Wow. And this was just a little little too loosey, you know, for him. It's improvising stuff and, what do you, what, you know, this is not in my script. Uh, wow. But, again, uh, it wasn't the right fit. Well, I can see why she took a 40-year hiatus before anyone wanted to see her again. <laughs> well, look, it's, it's, it's good. Uh, you don't want to uh, overexpose yourself. <laughs> so, I mean, I ran into her a long time ago. I said, well, it's good that we see each other every 30 years. <laughs> uh, well, but, you know, you know uh, I tell you, her reputation uh, from that movie Honestly, really, I think this destroyed her career. The character in the movie, in the book, it was a book too, was heavy and overweight, and she was a little heavy at that time, so she went on a diet and lost a ton of weight. She did everything they didn't want her to do. Wow. So, you know, I remember Robert Evans was head of Paramount at that time. He showed up on the set, and he was knocking on her dressing room door saying, Jeannie, it's Bob. Will you let me in? Oof. I'm standing there thinking... He's head of the studio, and she, you know, again, I was new. I had just, but I knew. I thought just out of not being rude, the head of the studio is knocking on your door. She wouldn't let him in. So, wow. So I learned what bad behavior was and what not to do. That's amazing, though. The head, Robert Evans, the wild Robert Evans, the kid stays in the picture. Robert Evans is trying to beg 
this near do well to come out of her. <laughs> yeah, come out, come out, please. You know, we're doing a movie here, and she was <laughs> in her dressing room rewriting and rewriting and re and the two writers were also in the movie and on the set, and so, but they didn't. I don't think it bothered them. Uh, Gail Parent and Kenny Soames, they were. They are terrific writers. Gail you know, Parent, she used, to, she used to be best friends with Kelly Lang, the Channel 4 newswoman out here. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Wow. But by the way, Sandy, I'm, could you talk about Up the Creek, your movie for Sam Markoff <laughs> when Jeff East? Yeah, I can only talk, uh, I can only say certain things about that movie because <laughs> otherwise I could probably, I don't know if the statute of limitations is over. <laughs> <laughs> Or those kind of things, but um, it was uh, it was that was so much fun and so much debauchery <laughs> and so much crazy stuff. Again, the stuff that was going on off the set was crazier and funnier than the movie itself. Uh, they, they what was interesting was that my wife uh, Harriet, who's a casting director, was casting that film. And, uh, oh, sure, sure, yeah. Like someone said, uh, I had to sleep with the casting director to get the part. Uh, <laughs> at that time, I'd been sleeping with her for almost 20 years. I finally <laughs> got a part. Uh, so, um, uh, so I get there, and to me, okay, I've got a, a lead role in this movie. I'm going to behave myself because I'm going to, it's going to, this will be my breakthrough role. And... And they and they let me uh, in, they let me improvise. They did ask me to rewrite some of the scenes, um, the rafting stuff. When I got there, I just assumed it was all going to be stunt guys, but we did uh, a lot of. I was Stephen first, and I Stephen first was such a great guy. Poor guy, passed away. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, he and I, of course, the two Jews were scared to death. They, uh, we got there a month before, and they were training us to, to raft. And I never did anything like that. I was the last one down. They said everyone else had gone down the, the river except me. I said, I can't do this. And the director said, then he said you can't be in the movie. Wow. So they finally got me in the raft. And once I went down those rapids, I was hooked. I loved it. <laughs> I said, take me back up. So they trained us, and, uh, you know, you're out there in the wilderness. And and we got, uh, so we were supposed to be the bad team. So when we started shooting, we, you know, we're supposed to be goofy. We came down those rapids. We look like an Olympic team. Wow. And the, director <laughs> said, the director said to us, uh, excuse me, you guys are supposed to be losers <laughs> and funny. And not, he said, not good rafters. He said, you know, like hit each other with the, with the oars. And so we had to do it again. Oh and, man. You know, Here you are coming out like pros. Man. Like, <laughs> oh yeah. We were so proud of ourselves. We never, uh, you know, again, you're thinking, look how good we look, you know, rafting here. So we're kicking it ass, no, man. <laughs> yeah. No, the, the other oh. ones have to look good. You have to look bad. Oh. So, and I was, a, I'm not a good swimmer. We had to jump. In one scene, we had to jump off the raft and into the water because of the. Uh, we did it a few times. I stopped jumping in because I waited because he would always yell "cut." So I thought I'm not going in until <laughs> they point to me and say. So I go into the water and I go down and as I come up, the raft comes up over me and I'm like stuck to the bottom of the raft <laughs> and it's heading down the river and I can't get it off me. And I look, and I can see in the water the stunt guys in scuba gear are looking for me way on the other side. Oh, no. And they're not looking for me where I am. And I thought I was a goner. I saw my glasses go down, and I thought, oh, God, what is it going to say in Variety? Um, uh, <laughs> actor dies in B-movie, you know. <laughs> uh, and, <laughs> And I, you know, but I'll tell you, I thought, and, and they finally rescued me and I was suffering from, from hypothermia and oh, it was wow. scary. I thought, 
I said, I thought at least if it was like something for deliverance and I drowned, but up the creek, you know. <laughs> so, but again, it, it was a lot of fun. It was like summer camp and, you know, Tim Matheson and I became buddies. We all became buddies and wow. Jeff and, you know, and like I said, it was like three months of summer camp. It was in uh, May, June, and July. Oh, yeah. And, so the water was perfect. Yeah. Hey. Oh, and then you had Mount Hood where you went up, which Oregon. was a few miles away, and, you, and you'd be in the snow. Wow. Like in, in, in June. So you so shot it in all in Oregon? Did you shoot it in Oregon, Sandy? Yeah, Bend, Oregon. Wow. And, uh, I've been there. and Sam Arkoff, uh, Sam Arkoff, when he came to the set, one of the girls, uh, you know, was supposed to take uh, her top off. And when Jennifer. we got to Oregon, uh, well, I'm not going to say. She <laughs> didn't want to take her top off, you know. <laughs> and so I remember one morning we came in the van, and it was like Alfred Hitchcock. You saw Sam Arkoff, his profile, standing at the end of the driveway with a, a, a foot-long cigar. Wow. And he had a huge stomach. Yeah. And he just... He just stood there, you know, and, uh, wait, hold on one second. Hold Cheers. on, hold on. Sam Arkoff, the beam of a king. Okay, uh, anyway, so, so he uh, stood there, and we came out of the car, and he said something. I heard him talking to the director, and he said, what do you mean she doesn't want to take her top off? He said, how does she expect to be an actress in this town if she won't take yeah. her top off? Yeah, I... This was before Harvey Weinstein or any of that, but, uh... <laughs> Sam, I got to meet Sam a couple times. Sam's daughter produced a movie my brother wrote, and I remember meeting. Uh, I remember meeting and shaking hands with Arkoff, and I remember saying, "Where's your cigar?" This is when uh, the his daughter was married to the head of Disney. Joe and, Roth. Yeah, Joe Roth was there with him, and I, I was kind of ignoring Joe Roth because it was friggin' Sam Arkoff, and he goes. My doctor won't let me have my cigars anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but he still had that great distended belly. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know, I mean, he looked like the cliche movie mogul from the yeah. 50s. Yeah. Which, of and course, he was. I, I love talking to him. He said, he said, you know, back when they really, this was like for AIP, a big budget movie. Oh, know, yeah. At that time, it was $7 million. Wow. He said the way he used to do his movies or that they would first come up with the title and then a poster and wow. if they liked it they would write a script wow those were the dreams yeah, he man said, why? he said why go the other way pay a lot of money for a writer let's see if the title and the poster works and if it does then we'll hire a writer to write a script by the way that makes complete sense to me you know <laughs> yeah and uh then he gave the business over to his son, Lou. Yeah. And uh, and the director was Bob Butler. Who, who directed Star Trek Chris pilot and Batman. He directed the... Are you, are you still in touch with Bob Butler? No. I, he's like in his 90s now. He directed... Bob Butler. I don't know. He directed... He, he, he uh, developed the handheld stuff for like Hill Street Blues. Right, right. Uh, he, Right. He did all those uh, uh, St. Elsewhere. He created that uh, handheld and everyone has been... But he, he directed... What he did that's so famous, though, Sandy, is he directed... Jeff, you want to... Uh, he directed the cocked angle cameras of the villain's headquarters on Batman. That was all Bob. He directed the pilot. Right, right, right. right. And did so, uh, he, he, you know, look, Bob is great, but he wasn't like the kind of college, high school comedy type of director. Kind of a uh, heck of a so, ton. <laughs> yeah, well, but he, so that's why, you know, he used to let me improvise. And, you know, if I had the ideas for any of the other actors as far as dialogue, he would, uh, you know, we went one time, uh, we would go to dailies after the shoot. Before we go to dailies, everyone would hit the bar have a few drinks, and then we'd go see dailies, and Bob Butler, after a few drinks, uh, some of my stuff came up on the dailies, and uh, I would sit in the back, and he'd yell, Albert, where are you? And I'd say, back here, he said, you crazy MF. I don't know what to say 
<laughs> and every night, that's what he'd say. Elmer, I'm right back here. You crazy, yeah, man. <laughs> <laughs> You're one of my favorite oh, things in that movie, though. You're so damn funny in it. Oh, it, it was it was fun, you know. It was fun, and again, like to me, that one stunt towards the end of the movie when it blows up. Yeah. You know, I mean, they they built a house. I mean, just the exterior from the ground up. They had water tanks with hundreds of thousands of gallons of water up the hill. And then they put the stunt guys in the raft behind the house. They opened up those uh, water things, and they literally pushed the water through the house with the raft. They came out the front, and the stunt guys, it was an amazing effect. For The effect was probably better than the whole movie. <laughs> <laughs> and it cost a fortune to do that, to blow up a house and send all the water down. You know, but uh, but thank God we had I had a stunt guy because uh, I just you know I just couldn't uh, uh, like I said I just tried not to get wet. The only other time I had I, I, I have to tell you I had a stunt guy. Uh, I did one of the Wild Wild West movies. I think I did. The you revisited with with uh, Conrad and uh, and uh, Artemis Gordon, yeah. Ross Martin. Right, right. It was uh, called More Wild Wild West, and then Jonathan Winters was in it, and Victor Buono and Harry Morgan. I only worked with the old guys when I was young. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, but it had a great cast. And so when I read for it in L.A., of course, they always ask you, you can you ride a horse? Oh, sure, sure, sure. <laughs> so I read, and I got the call, and I, and I go to Tucson, which is where we shot it. Oh, you, sh you shot at the old Tucson studios, didn't you? Yeah. Wow, those are beautiful. We, uh, we had a day off, and uh, the whole cast was in, it was too hot to go outside. The whole cast was in the uh, uh, coffee shop in the hotel. And we see, and we're looking out the window, and we see Harry Morgan and Jonathan Winters running across the highway. And Harry Morgan came in, and Jonathan Winters stood outside doing 10 minutes to a bush. <laughs> and I, and we or anything he said, but just looking at him visually, we were hysterical. He's just out there in 110 degrees doing a monologue to a bush, and we're all laughing inside the shop. Wow. So my scene, my scene with Robert Conrad, I come in and I tell him they want to hire, they want him to come back to Washington D.C. And then the bad, he comes flying into the room because bad guys are chasing him, and they're shooting off loads all over the place, and I'm scared to death. The director tells me now, okay, now after this scene, you and Bob are going to jump out the window onto your horses oh, no. and ride off. <laughs> and I said, wait, 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 wait. I said, you asked if I could ride a horse. You didn't ask if I can jump on a window and jump on a horse. I said, I got to start out on the horse. <laughs> and he said, no, no, we don't want that. They hired a local guy who was a terrific rider. And they put him in my wardrobe. And uh, so I jump out the window with Bob Conrad, and they cut to the two of us riding out. And, of course, the kid was a great, was able to ride a horse. He was like a jockey. He left Conrad in the dust. Wow. You know? <laughs> so, the, so the director called. He said, look, he said, uh, uh, slow down. And I told the guy, I said, look, the character's kind of goofy. I said, instead of looking like a jockey, can you bounce? up and down and hold, I had to wear a derby, hold the derby on. <laughs> wow. And that's what he did. So I even looked funny riding away <laughs> with another guy wearing my hat. Wow. <laughs> like, like a 30s movie or cartoon holding the hat on. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. That's right, yeah. And I, I still run into Bob Conrad occasionally out here. How was he? Movie. How was Conrad? I don't know. You know, I think he had, I mean, I don't think. I know he had a stroke. Wow. But he still looks terrific, and you know, see him once in a while uh, out with his daughters, uh, his kids. You know, uh, he was a he was he was a good guy. Look again, he was a pro. He'd been around a long time, and uh, you know, uh, it was uh, it was great. To, again, I just I you know I love working, and to me, every experience was 
was a great thing, except Hollywood Nights was very difficult. Tell me why, because, I mean, everybody in that movie became big. I mean, Gary Graham, uh, uh, Robert Wool. Yeah. You know? Talk yeah, about Robert that, Wall. please. I'm, I'm like, oh, holy Brent. cow, Michelle Pfeiffer's in that, Brent. right? That was Michelle Pfeiffer's first movie. Wow. Um, and again, it's a coincidence. My wife was casting that movie. And uh, I went in and I tested for the part of uh, that Robert Wall did. And you know what? Uh, Robert Wall, was, it was better. So uh, I liked playing the cop with Gaylord Sartain. You know, we were like the Laurel and Hardy guys. Right. And so, uh, yeah, it was Michelle Pfeiffer's first movie. Amazing. Her agent called, called my wife and he said, I got this actress. Uh, she, working, she was working in a grocery store at the time. And uh, they brought her. Yeah, she was working at Vons, true. She was working at Vons by yeah. the beach. Yeah. Yeah. So every night, because we shot the movie at night, uh, I would give her a grocery list. <laughs> <laughs> No, so the movie, we would shoot it at night. We'd start at 6 o'clock in the evening and shoot till 6 in the morning. And like I said, everything was improvised. In, uh, I don't want to badmouth people, but he, the director was uh, completely out of his mind. There were a lot of drugs going on. A lot of drugs going on then. No script. We just made this stuff up. Wow. And, uh, but Gaylord, uh, who was, you know loaded usually by the time he got there he at the first few days we had to share a dressing room he'd show up with like a steel briefcase and then he'd lay it down and i heard something rolling in there and he opened it there was nothing in that briefcase except a bottle of gin no who was this uh, who was this uh, this was the director or this was the star uh gaylord sartain he played the heavy cop oh. skinny cop and gaylord i mean i I would think you would know him. He's, he played the big bopper in the Buddy Holly story. Okay, I know exactly who you're talking about. Wow. Yeah, he's a, he's a, he, he's a, uh, you know, he's from Oklahoma, so he and Gary Busey were tight. And, <laughs> you know, he knew, he, I mean, he's done so many great films and worked with Gene Hackman and Paul Newman, and, but he is one of the funniest people, just hysterical, especially when he was drunk. And so he, uh, <laughs> So, you know, uh, we improvise stuff, and uh, uh, and like I said, uh, uh, Tony Danza, and uh, I don't know who else uh, was in it. So anyway, so I had a good time playing the cop, and, uh, you know, I was able to get my two brothers in as extras. Really? They, they never, <laughs> yeah, they never, they, they never did thank me for it. Imagine all this time. But, uh, <laughs> so yeah, so like I said, we just improvised what we wanted and, uh, you know, the movie didn't quite turn out again uh, the way we wanted it. But look, you can only do so much as an actor. Sure, uh, sure. So, uh, I, I, like I said, it was, it was very crazy too. That was very crazy to work all night. TK Connor. Try and go home. I couldn't, you know, come by the time you get home, it's eight o'clock in the morning. I couldn't like go to sleep. You know, wow. uh, so worked well, on very little sleep. And you wrote uh, this amazes me. You you wrote an episode of Golden Girls. That was our first writing job, my wife and I. Which one? Oh, which episode did you guys write? Our, our our episode was the one hundredth episode. Wow! So, well, that's cool. That's better so than ninety nine. Our episode made everybody rich because it then went into syndication. When you uh, <laughs> back then, now it's different. When you hit a hundred episodes, is when they start running a show in syndication, because you had enough episodes to keep it going. Jeez. So, wow. my, so, so my wife and I came in and pitched some stories, and they liked a couple of them, and uh, we wound up writing the one that um, uh, I liked. It was called Foreign Exchange. And it was when uh, they thought Dorothy uh, had been switched in the hospital. And uh, her parents came, and they wanted to take Dorothy back to Italy with them. And they took, brought their daughter, who they didn't think was their daughter. I don't know <laughs> if, you get, if you get that. Yeah, yeah, And, yeah. of course, when the, do 
when the daughter came in, she looked exactly like Estelle, uh, Estelle Getty. <laughs> You know, same, you know, uh, B. Arthur was six feet tall. This woman was the same height, carried a purse, wore glasses, and Vito Scotti played the father. Good old we Vito Scotti, the, one of the most popular I character mean, actors of all time. Oh, he was, you know, I mean, this was our first script, and I knew the producers, which is how we got the pitch. Doesn't mean they would buy it. Right. And I said, you know... We wrote this role specifically for Vito. I don't know if you want to. They hired him. He <laughs> found out that we wrote the part specifically for him. So he invited my wife and, and I over to his house for dinner. <laughs> and he wanted us to write a series for him. Wow. And he, he gave us an outline where he would play a hairdresser. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> and, no. uh, you know, for some reason, because it was the hundredth episode and it was a big deal, we told him. We said, "Look, we're not producers on this show. We just happened to get this episode, and we wanted you in it." And he pitched us the idea, and I said, "Well, I, let me go uh, talk to someone." And you know, there was nothing. We we weren't in any kind of position. To, <laughs> Other than come and sit at Vito Scotti's table, and he made a home cooked meal. Wow. Was it good? You know, which was amazing. Yeah. yeah. Now, how about. Uh, but he was. Oh, go ahead. No, go ahead. No, that's you, Sandy. He was what? He was, he was a. I mean, he did. He was in everything. You know, yeah. he really was. One of my favorite shows that made me a little weird was and still is The Rifleman. Uh huh. And Vito Scotti did like half a dozen episodes of those. Played a Japanese guy. He played <laughs> a bat. He played a uh, bat Tito. You know, they put in like the big teeth. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, he, you know, really, he has worked with everyone. He has been in everything. And he was a very humble guy, but he was a terrific actor. And he was a little sensitive, you know, but... Uh, like I said, it was it was exciting. When he turned ninety, uh, when I, I use this in, uh, in one of my books, I mentioned this fact. When Vito Scotti turned ninety, TV Land did what they called Vito Scotti Week, where they ran <laughs> every single show, every single oh. show in their lineup. They would only run episodes with Vito Scotti. He was the Penguin's wow. assistant on Batman. He was on uh, I, Dr I Dream a Genie. He was on Get Smart. He was on The Addams Family. You know, I mean, he did so many shows. He, was, he did everything. You know, he, uh, uh, you know, whatever. I thought I worked with him somewhere else. No, that was, uh, no. But I, uh, but yeah, you know, he worked with Sinatra in, in a couple of his movies. You know, just worked on the book. He has that great scene in The Godfather. Oh, the yeah. Random. Oh, yeah. He's, he's the, the baker. He's the baker. The he baker. Was, <laughs> right. He says, oh, why do you see the cake I make? Oh, fuck. <laughs> and, you know, I thought he sat there, just him and Brando, I mean, <sighs> face to face. You know, but to him, it was just another job. Just I another ham and egger job. Wow, wow, wow. Just a, he was one yeah. of those guys who went from gig to gig, Ham and Eggers, you know? Absolutely. He was a character actor who worked all the time, who made a pretty good living because everyone, and he was one of a kind. So everyone, yeah, I think he was a recurring character on the flying nun. He played the yes. cop. Yes, and, yes, uh, yes, yes. He, would, he would always bug out his eyes when she was flying. <laughs> right. right. So he, uh, so yeah, again, uh, I was, thrilled to get with, to work with these guys, you know, and, uh, uh, you know. Hey, what about, uh, Sandy, oh, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. What about Modern Problems, that crazy Chevy Chase gets psychic powers movie you did? Oh, Modern Problems. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, that was, uh, you know, it was, uh, I knew Chevy Chase, uh, uh, or Saturday Night Live because uh, when they were still scouting, he would come along with uh, Lauren Michaels. Uh, it was great for me. I didn't, you know, anything I don't have to audition for, I'm thrilled. <laughs> so I didn't, I didn't have to audition for it. I had, a, I worked for a week, and the character I did 
was the character I just created. There was nothing in the script. Wow. It just said Pete. And uh, so the thing with the glasses and the cigarette, I went to the prop guys and I said, I, I, wanna, I want the ash to be real long. <laughs> so they showed me what they do. They take a wire and they put it in the cigarette and the ash doesn't fall off. Wow. You, know, you can smoke it down to the filter. So again, a lot of that stuff was improvised. Um, the director, Ken Shapiro, I think it was the other than um, he did, he and Chevy Chase were partners on Groove 2. Oh, that's Remember right. That? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. He only yeah. did like one or Ken two Shapiro. movies after that, right? Yeah, I think the only one he did after that was Modern Problem. Wow. He was a pretty crazy guy, Ken Shapiro. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, again, there was a lot of debauchery going on. Not me, I, you know, but, uh, <laughs> you know, those guys. I heard about it. But you know what? You also did one of my favorite shows that I've discovered on in syndication on, on MeTV. You did Too Close for Comfort. Talk about Nancy DeSalt and Ted Knight. <laughs> you know, there was another uh, uh, part I didn't have to audition for. Uh, the producer, uh, the executive producer and writer, was a producer writer on a series I did called Flatbush. Really? You know, yeah, it, uh, it was on CBS. They canceled it after three episodes in 1975. <laughs> wow. And... Uh, so they had this uh, part, and uh, they called, you know, they offered it to me, and um, I, I got to work with Lou Jacoby, you know. Who he oh, is. the great character from Amazon Women of the Moon. I'm coming home. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes. He, he, he was in Arthur, the one with Dudley Moore. He played the florist, and I, I love, he went over to Dudley Moore, he says, tell me. What is it like having all that money? You know, <laughs> yeah. and so, so I, he played my father, <laughs> and uh, he was he was Ted uh, Knight. Uh, you know, I was a huge fan of his from Mary Tyler Moore. You know, he, that's the kind of role I always wanted was not the lead, but the guy who comes in, gets a few laughs, and leads. Right, right. And uh, so uh, he was very straight. Uh, a, a little rigid wow. and um, you know he's not he wasn't the kind of guy you were off off uh, camera would sit around and joke with um, but the woman who played my mother uh, Audrey Meadows Audrey Meadows uh, and the Honeymooners he, yes wow. she was such a class act she came in to work every day dressed in like, you know, Halston or something. And you weren't allowed to smoke on a set, but she smoked. Ed Knight hated to smoke, so he'd run to his dressing room. Uh -huh. And I would sit there with her every day, and she would tell me honeymoon honeymooners stories. And I loved the honeymooners. And again, I'd sit there and look at her and think to myself, I'm sitting here with Alice Cranston. She's playing... <laughs> My mother. Wow. Playing my mother. That's and amazing. she told me stories about Jackie Gleason and Art Carney. Again, to me, that was just, you know, such insight. And um, especially for... Uh, so, yeah. So, again, he was a nice guy that night, but very straight, rigid, <laughs> and, you know, uh, knew what he had to do. And, uh, you know, it... Uh, it was his show, and Nancy Dusso was very sweet. Wow! Uh, look, they're all nice. The other guy, J. M. Bullock, was oh a yeah, very nice yeah, guy. and the girls, of Jim course. Bullock. The two girls were very nice. Although I think the older sister by then may have left the show. The one with the dark hair. Yeah, Diane something from the Warriors. Yeah, right, right. But uh, so yeah, so again, you know. But the good thing was Ted uh, Ted Knight. And I, if I came up with a little piece of business and he liked it, he would do it, you know, like in the scene, I'm supposed to hug him. And so I just did it on my own. I went and hugged him and shook him a little bit <laughs> and got a big laugh because that his hair, you know, just kind of flopped up and yeah. down that white hair. Was that his real and hair, by the way? Looked, <laughs> oh, yeah. I oh, grabbed wow. him by the hair and banged his head on the table. It didn't come off. <laughs> but... Uh, but but you know what? He, he so he liked it, and when he would said to, said to me, 
And again, he'd say, that was a good piece of business. Uh, <laughs> Ted Baxter. This is Ted ba- you know, it, it was, I, I still, at my age, still don't get over that sense of, wow, you know. Uh, I've never become blasé at meeting. You shouldn't. People. You must never do that, you know? No, no. When you, you know, uh, uh, especially, you know, legends and icons that, oh, you, yeah. uh, that you like and uh, respect. And uh, so, uh, yeah, so like what else? Uh, Speaking of which, I did an episode of, I did an episode of Night Court. Oh, yeah. I, tell us about that. That was a lot of fun, too, because it had uh, a huge cast in it. Uh, I played a uh, John Larkett, who's an old friend, wow. and uh, um, Marky Post saves, oh, he saves her life. She was choking. He <laughs> gave her the Heimlich. I and you well. he, she said, anything you want, I will do, because you saved my life. So, of course, what does he want to do? Sleep with her. <laughs> Go to a hotel, and here's this guy out on the ledge. B, I'm out on the ledge, and uh, I'm knocking on the window, and like I said, I ruined his night with her. And the reason why I was going to commit suicide was I was 38 years old, and I was still a virgin. And uh, so I was going to jump off the building. And one at a time, characters kept entering. One of the cops was played by Carmine Caridi. You know who he is? I do. He's in a ton of New York stuff. Uh, he was in The Godfather, too. Oh, that's you right. Know. That's right. But hes uh, I think he was even on The Incredible Hulk. <laughs> he may have been. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. But the fact that he was in The Godfather was enough for me, you know. And... Uh, uh, Gino Conforti, I don't know if you know who he is. He's such a character. He's wow. sort of like Vito Scotti. And so there I am on, on the ledge, and, uh, you know, uh, John Larkett says, just be, uh, he said, don't ruin my night because of your problems. <laughs> I was going to jump. So I, again, came up with the piece uh, where I leaned. I was going to jump, and John grabs me by the shirt and pulls me in the window. And uh, so... Uh, Again, it was fun, and it was, and I again worked with with uh, you know the whole, the whole cast, and uh, uh, that was uh, that's what that was. And, and New Heart, I, I did two episodes of New Heart, which I really loved doing. I did one episode at the beginning of the season, Small uh-huh. Heart, and they called me in, and I, again I didn't have to audition, and it was a, a terrific part. I played. Uh, uh, Larry's night school teacher. And by the way, and, uh, Cindy, I hate to do this. We're in the last 30 seconds of the show. I just realized we're off at 5 2. Please promote yourself on your website and come back because we haven't even gotten to Remington Steel. Oh, okay. And this, this was a lot of fun. I really appreciate you guys. Cindy, we love gone. this. Right, Jeff? I mean, That's right. Uh, I really appreciate you hey. calling in, man. That was a great interview. Now, let me just ask you, uh, if, if I want to, can I get a copy of this? Is Hells a, yes, uh, it's going right on to YouTube. Okay, I will go uh, pick it up and... Uh, we'll we'll try to, we're not, we're not engineers, we have these guys doing it from home on, on, on their computers at the studio, we're here by ourselves. <laughs> but it will be, uh, it'll be the wow. Jeff and Janky show for June 20th, 2018. And, and we'll figure out, we'll get it to you. Okay, I appreciate it. And uh, thank you, guys. It was terrific. The and pleasure was ours. Thank you, sir. And give your lovely wife okay. and uh, grandchild a hug for us, okay? <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you, Sandy. Right. God bless, and thank, thank you so much. You're very entertaining. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Uh, All right, right, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. We have uh, the famous ticket scalper from... from Fast Times at Ridge Mountain High, Robert Romano. Robert Romano. Mike Damone, the ticket scalper. More importantly, he'll be pr- promoting his band. His band will come in. Yes, uh, Papa's Kitchen. They'll Papa's be playing Kitchen their guitars person. and singing some songs, too. He, he has a great song called Table for One. I'm going to try and make him sing tomorrow. All right. Well, hey, kill streaming so we can talk freely. <laughs> great show.